Hello, everybody. We are back with a bonus episode for you this week. Uh, this time, it's uh, me and Matt joining you uh, with a guest who has joined us. We are speaking with uh, journalist Vincent Bevins about his uh, newly released book, The Jakarta Method, about the Indonesian genocide in the uh, early 1960s and the long shadow it's cast over American foreign policy and really the pretty much the lives of everyone on the planet uh, that we lead continuing into the 21st century. So, Vincent, thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me. I guess like just like to, to start off with like from because, you know, your book is kind of about how this is like a, a major forgotten chapter in the history of the 20th century and the history of this country, certainly. But just to start from like the broadest possible perspective, uh, what was the Indonesian genocide? When did it happen? Like who carried it out and who did they kill and why? Yeah, so this was, uh, as you said, very important but forgotten. I think it's probably the most important turning point in the Cold War uh, and probably the most important victory for the side that ultimately won, which was the the construction of sort of a, a capitalist world order. But it happened in 1965. It was the U.S.-assisted execution of approximately one million innocent people. These were mostly members of the Indonesian Communist Party, which was the largest party in the world at the time. And it was an unarmed moderate party that had won elections for most of its um, existence. And this was done um, so that Suharto, the uh, U.S.-backed dictator, could take over. And when he did take over in 1965, he replaced Sukarno, who was a very important leader of the left-leaning Third World Movement at the time. And then after Suharto was in there, you never hear about Indonesia again because he is a faithful U.S. ally and despite the crimes that allowed him to take power and the horrible crimes that he continues to commit in his own country and in the region, uh, he just kind of fades into the memory hole uh, for decades and decades. Um, uh, like a, a big part of uh, what you talk about is how important Indonesia was to overall Cold War strategy. And I remember reading a, a long time ago from uh, like Noam Chomsky, who talked about how for from the perspective of U.S. state planners, uh, America had already won the Vietnam War by 1965 because of this genocide. Could you explain that and also like give us some perspective about how just how just how big a success this genocide was from the U.S. a U.S. policy perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So in the early 60s, basically everyone in the U.S. foreign policy establishment agreed that Indonesia was far more important than Vietnam. So Indonesia is now the fourth largest country in the world by population. Um, Sukarno who was this leader of this global movement to oppose the hegemonic order as it was um, taking shape in the first decades after World War II. Perhaps I'll just go back and explain sort of what Indonesia is. So Indonesia is 13,000 islands that used to be dominated by Dutch colonialism, right? The only thing that brought these 13,000 islands together was hundreds of years of brutal European colonialism. So in 1945, after the Japanese are kicked off uh, these islands because they invaded during World War II when they were aligned with Nazi Germany, uh, President Sukarno, who was this very, he's like a founding father more than a, a president, right? So he was a real visionary. He brought together the different religions and ethnicities and kind of political strains on these islands to create Indonesia, right? And in the early years of the Cold War, he was seen as somebody the United States could deal with more or less. They didn't like that he was left-leaning. They didn't like that he was Marxist-friendly. They didn't like that he was such a strident anti-colonialist, but for a long time it was seen as okay. Like he could, he could exist in this world order that the United States was now leading as it um, emerged from World War II as the most powerful nation in history. But the problem was in the 1950s, the Indonesian Communist Party, the PKI, which is the uh, oldest communist party in Asia, they started winning more and more elections, right? And we know now from declassified documents, the CIA and the U.S. Embassy in Jakarta they knew that the reason they were winning these elections is because they were the best organized and they were doing all the things that a party should do. They were going out and talking to people and convincing people they can improve their lives. Um, so in the first part of the 50s, not only is the PKI, the Indonesian Communist Party, doing really well, in 1955, Sukarno organizes this hugely important meeting of the countries of Africa and Asia. It's the 1955 Bandung Conference. And as he calls it, it's the first ever meeting of the so-called color peoples in the history of the world. And the idea is to stand up to hundreds of years of European colonialism and create a new world. So the third world 
in the most positive sense. Uh, you know, the first world had their try. The second world is the Soviet Union and its allied countries in Eastern Europe. And we're going to be the new unity that overthrows this order and takes our place on the world stage. And these two things really bothered Washington. Um, Sukarno leading this third world movement, along with other leaders from India and Iraq, and that the Communist Party was just doing better and better. And so the first thing that the United States tried to do was to bribe other actors in the political scene. So they tried to give loads of money to the right-wing Muslim party in, uh, in elections, and that just didn't work, right? So, then they, so in the middle of the 50s, Indonesia goes from being, oh, it's a former colonial power, it's a post-colonial nation that we can kind of deal with, to being something they're trying to solve. And then the, the entire sort of CIA the young CIA apparatus kicks into force uh, in a lot, of, uh, a lot of varied and ridiculous ways in the 1950s. Oh, uh, that reminds me. This is one thing uh, from the book that I really wanted to talk about. And you're talking about the, uh, how uh, Sukarno became this boogeyman in Washington as a potential challenge to America's post-war hegemony and that there were a bunch of things that the CIA did. One of them, of course, you might talk some more about it, I don't know, uh, was to f- uh, uh, arm and uh, and support a separatist movement uh, within Indonesia, uh, an armed insurgency to, to undermine Sukarno. But I think my favorite one is the j- most James Elroy thing I've ever heard of happening in real life. And I'd actually read about this before, but this is the f- first time I've ever encountered it uh, anywhere else, and I wanted to talk to you about it. My, one of my favorite CIA uh, uh, plans of all time, which was to hire a uh, a Mexican guy, make him look like Sukarno with makeup, and film a, a porn with him yeah. that would then be released in Indonesia and undermine his uh, credibility, I guess, was and, the plan. And, and hire Bing Crosby to do it. Bing, Bing Crosby was the producer of this of this film. <laughs> Um, <laughs> do we know anything about the actor that they uh, that they cast in this? Uh, there's like various like racially insensitive terms that you can find in the extant literature of either whether he was like Chicano or Chicano looking or Mexican American looking. They tried to get pornographic actors uh, active in Hollywood, and they tried to create a fake sex tape. And the idea was, and this is a really interesting thing about like the United States as an entity, right? Because all these CIA guys are Yale blue blood Protestant guys and what and they sort of think in a very american way that the rest of the world has the same morality as they do so they don't realize that every they don't realize that everybody in indonesia already knows that this guy has loads of sex all the time (laughs) and and nobody cares so like it's really famous that sukarno is um you know at one point he has like several wives but so but they think that they're going to destroy his reputation so they hire actors in los angeles bing crosby and his brother larry i think it is Produce the film, um, according to our reports. And the idea is they're going to say that the KGB did a honeypot on him, and now he's in the... The KGB controls him because he had sex with a Russian blonde girl. So it was going to be... like I think they, there's different reports that they were going to put him... They put the actor in a bald wig because they wanted to make him look bald, which was going to make him look... Like, they thought that, you know, Indonesians would no longer respect him if he was bald and looked like shit. And then they also put a mask on this... Mexican maybe guy to make him look Asian. Uh, in the end, they did not release the film, not because they thought this was a horrible thing to do to the founding father of one of the most important countries in the world, but because the film was just like like was shit. Like they knew that it wouldn't work. Yeah, that's and why it, you need the industrial lights and magic guys. Bro. Yeah, I mean, I think now, well, I think now you could just say it, right, and everyone would just believe it. But uh, so yeah, in, in that same period, we now know the CIA authorized his assassination, but again, didn't go through with it. And in 1958, this was a tip number two to stop Sukarno and the PKI. Uh, as Matt said, the CIA bombed Indonesia. And then this is, again, this is like totally in the memory hole. At the time, this was the largest CIA operation that had ever been undertaken. And the reason that we know that it happened is because a CIA pilot crashed his plane into one of the islands and got caught. He had his identifying papers on him. His name was Alan Pope. And for all of 1958, the left wing of Indonesian politics was saying, like, I think the United States is trying to break our country into pieces. And the U.S. ambassador, who didn't know about the invasion because he was brought in precisely so he would not know, was saying, like, what are you talking about? Like, that's crazy. And then, like, an American guy just got caught on the island. And so, yeah, I mean, this was 
sort of phase two of their attempt to get rid of Sukarno, and they tried every single thing they could, and they were very badly discredited by this failed invasion, right? So the, the left side of Indonesian politics was sort of proved right. Um, Sukarno, even though he couldn't even, you know, no matter how much he wanted to be independent of America, he couldn't stand up to Washington at this point. He still had to sort of pretend that it was okay. I mean, this is the this is what U.S. hegemony really was at the time. I mean, countries in this part of the world, including Vietnam, they really wanted to make America think that they were not their enemies. They really wanted to stay on good terms with them. So even after the CIA blew up the country, he still stayed, stayed sort of friends with the United States, but he, was clo- he moved slightly closer to the Soviet Union. And the United States shifts its tactics and um, starts training army officers in Kansas, thousands of them, um, with the idea of instead of taking the military on directly – bringing them to America, taking them to strip clubs, giving them loads of money, and getting them to believe in American values, whatever that is, and trying to, trying to train anti-communists in, in Kansas. And, and one of the characters in the book um, like spent a lot of these nights out with these guys in Kansas and sort of understood what they were going through back in America after, after the CIA invasion. All right, so like that, that, was their, that was the first attempt to get rid of uh, Sukarno. But then like, how, how do things like, like really ramp up? Um, like with, uh, could you talk about the guy they choose who like to do the coup? It's uh, General Suharto like, yeah. comes in. And like, you know, so could, could you talk about like, how like, this, this, this next phase where like, the, the usual forms of subversion or overthrow of a, a, like a, a government who's not in the fold of U.S. hegemony, like that right. didn't work. So then like then they're going just like straight to like the death squad option. So like how do they yeah. how do they start doing this? And like like how how does it become so like how did what were the steps they did to lead up to this genocide? Exactly. So from nineteen fifty eight to nineteen sixty three or so they're training these officers in the United States, but they still kind of maintain this idea that they're gonna be friends with Indonesia. Um, and then two things happen. John F. Kennedy is murdered. Uh, Lyndon Johnson changes tactics because he doesn't want to spend the political capital to keep Sukarno on side. He doesn't want to have to justify in Congress why he's on such good terms with a quote-unquote communist. And he withdraws the ambassador that is supposed to be friendly with Indonesia and brings in one of these ambassadors that is obviously going to do a coup. Everybody knows that's why the ambassador is brought in. Secondly, uh, Sukarno picks a fight with, this, uh, with the United Kingdom over the creation of Malaysia because the, uh, the United Kingdom kind of draws Malaysia into weird shapes on purpose to weaken the left in Southeast Asia in a way that I think a lot of people are familiar with in, in Africa and the Middle East, like one of these imperial tricks where they draw lines across the map to uh, make sure that the left can't take power. And Sukarno picks a fight. Um, as a result of these two things, the shift, the LBJ shift and this fight with, with um, the UK, who was very important at the time to Washington because Washington needs to make sure that... Um, the, like, the Western powers were not standing up to them on Vietnam. The CIA and MI6 start talking about a plan, and we only know about this through declassified documents. We don't know the entire thing, but we know that they start saying repeatedly um, that they're going to try to create a clash between the army and the communists, and that that clash would ultimately re- result uh, in the army victory and crushing the left because the left in Indonesia had always been an unarmed party that believed in constructing socialism like 50 years from now. So their ideology was we're going to build bourgeois capitalism, anti-imperialism is first, and then in the year 2000 we're going to build socialism. They had no, they had no sort of Maoist theory of armed struggle. So in 1965 this class happens. In September, at the end of September 1965, there is a Small officers uprising, which is meant to kidnap a few officers. We still, to this day, don't know the exact nature of this uprising. But the clash has been created, right? This, this, this um, confrontation between the army and the PKI that, the, that MI6 and the CIA wanted to create, it happens. And right away now, all of this is declassified. And in the book, I, can, I lay out exactly what the ambassador is saying. They realize, he says, it's now or never, right? This is a chance to crush the, the Indonesian Communist Party. So the army, specifically two guys who were trained in Kansas, um, they activate a plan in a western part of Indonesia where they're telling people in speeches, you have to help us get the PKI or else we're going to get you. And then they start arresting people in mass. And people are arrested because they don't think anything is going to happen to them. So a lot of the people that I met that were victims of this violence, that survived or had their friends killed, they were like, yeah, yeah, I'll go down and like give an interview at the station. Like, you know, I'm just like in the teachers union or I'm, you know, I'm a farmer, like whatever. But they take them in and they never come out. 
So over the next three or four months, they have one million people that stay in concentration camps and another 500,000 to a million that are taken out in the middle of the night and just thrown in the river, killed. And this dynamic is very hard for people to stand up to because nobody knows what happened to their relatives, right? Like, we know about, like, disappearances in Latin America. Uh, it may be the case that disappearances in Latin America were sort of a copy of this really effective strategy. And at every step of the way, the U.S. State Department got reports, encouraged more killings by making it very clear that in order for them to receive international recognition that the PK, PK needed to be crushed, and handing lists of people to be killed over to the army and then waiting to see if they'd been checked off properly. And this is all stuff we didn't know for a very long time. It's only like work of like academics and activists that have been going at this for decades and decades that we finally put this picture together. But now it's very clear that the U.S. was like an active participant in the in the massacre. And, you know, you, you profile uh, uh, one woman in your book who was uh, 17 years old, who had just moved to Jakarta to make money working in a, like, a, like a textile um, like factory. And it, because she was in a trade union to ha- get that job, like it was, you know, a pretty good job and she would send money home. And then she goes home to visit her family when this all happens. And the cops come to her house and arrest her for be, just being a member of a trade union. And she wasn't like a political she, person for the most part. She was a 17 year old girl. And they arrest her, and then, like, that's the beginning of, like, a years-long uh, ordeal, like a nightmare. No, it's not over for her, too. Her name is Magdalena, and her life is still very, very difficult. Um, it's, it's never, like, unlike Latin America, these victims were never given in, like, a big, I'm sorry, you, you didn't do anything wrong. They still sort of live as outcasts and being told that they were, they were guilty. But, yeah. I mean, like, and you, you say that that really is kind of what the, the point of this atrocity was to, like, to, to both... Like to instill such a sense of fear and silence in the entire country that like n- that no one would ever like that to, to remind you that the people who did it are the victors. We won, and like part of our victory is making sure that like the the shame of what we did will never be discussed. Or like not only that, but that like it's shameful to have been a victim of of this or have a family member who was uh, murdered and taken away from you and like without any official recourse or acknowledgement of that. Yeah, and I mean, it was extraordinarily effective. And I think the reason that people like Magdalena could get swept up in this is that right before the massacre started, about 25 to 30% of the country was somehow in or affiliated with the Communist Party. So, like, you wouldn't be able to just take power and say, oh, we're the government now. Like, you needed this kind of very brutal, horrible, mass demonstration of, as you said, who's really the boss if you're going to take over a country where... The, the party that would have won the elections was the Communist Party, right? And this was extraordinarily effective. Um, everyone in Washington understood how effective this was. Uh, New York Times columnist James Reston wrote, wrote a very, you know, euphoric column about this, this huge success. And anti-communist movements around the world, and this is kind of where the book, like, takes its name, they understood how hugely effective this was. And they start talking about this, this Jakarta method or this Jakarta plan or Operation Jakarta, as something that they could do in their own country. Because obviously, Suharto got away with it, right? So if you, could, if you could kill a million innocent people and nothing happens to you, you become you know, best friends with, with, with the White House, people in Latin America, people in Southeast Asia, they all realize, oh, well, we could do really anything as long as we say that anti-communism is the reason. And they started coming up with copycat programs all around the world. And I found like in total, the entire Cold War from 1945 to you know, 1995 or so, over 20 countries backed by the United States, rallied with the United States, carried out some kind of mass murder of civilians, intentional extermin- extermination programs to get rid of either leftists or people they claimed that were leftists. I mean, so the final sort of thing that I think becomes clear after looking at all these horrible stories is that the mass murder of innocent civilians was a fundamental part of the way that the United States won the Cold War. And it affected the way that the Cold War shaped the order that followed it. I mean, I, I want to get into this connection to uh, other countries, and particularly Brazil, and how, how living and working there had led you to this story. But like, just what you just said, you, you write, I fear that the truth of what happened contradicts so forcefully our, ide- our idea of what the Cold War was, of what it means to be an American, or how globalization has taken place, that it has simply been easier to ignore it. And when I read that, like, I, I, I thought about how so much of our American national identity is tied up in World War II and the idea that we were the good guys in World War II. And, yeah. you know, we intervened and, like, we stopped a, a genocidal dictator and that if we hadn't intervened, like, he would have gotten away with it. 
and we might never have even known about it. That like we stopped that we were like we were the good guys, and there was an unambiguous bad guy. And then like the, the, to know about something like this so violently upends that like stories like this because we like the people in Indonesia, like the people who carried out those atrocities were the victors, and they were victorious because they were on our side. And and not only that, they're pretending that they're the real victims in all of this. And it's just like to win the Cold War, essentially, we had to become the thing that we are also proud of ourselves for defeating in World War Two. Yeah. And I think um, not only did they get did they win because they were on our side. The reason that they never got punished at all is because they're on their side. Right. So we all know about um, sort of Pol Pot. Right. We all know about any time a communist in the 20th century committed a crime. And, every, and, we, and we have, a, it's very easy for us to make these connections. Like, oh, that was the international communist movement. And whenever a communist in this country does something that uh, everyone's guilty. But it's equally true, if not more true, that in the 20th century, there was an international anti-communist movement that learned from each other, traded officials, um, traded, you know, they had these big meetings. There were several anti-communist uh, international organizations. And, we don't hear about that side of it. And I think, I mean, it's only speculation, but my best guess is that it's just too, it's not nice to think about, right? It's fear. If you run the world, which we do, and you know, every, you know, the three of us are all sort of beneficiaries indirectly, whether or not the United States is, does a good job of distributing those uh, benefits well to its people, we are sort of indirectly the beneficiaries of that victory. And it's just like, it's easier to talk about World War II. This is why, you know, that is the big historical thing that always happens, even though Indonesia, 1965, was, like I said, probably the most important victory of the Cold War. And you say that uh, because you introduce a, a concept, uh, a, a historical sort of interpretation of the Cold War as not about ideology uh, or even really competition between the Soviet Union and the United States as such, but more a contest to make to ensure from the point of view of the United States that the decolonized countries uh, of the new post world order in w- where in which the in which the old european basic old europe basically couldn't afford the price tag for their empires anymore it was the united the cold war was essentially the united states ensuring that even though those governments would no longer be colonial they would have a neo colonial relationship to the western powers yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know, it's hard to say what the original intent was, but I think that's what ended up happening, right? So in 1945, you had, you know, before World War II, you had a small group of white European countries that had formal dominance over the vast majority of humanity. And as a result of that formal dominance, the countries in the global south uh, experienced violence and economic underdevelopment, and they were excluded from the world system. After 1945, what you get is the United States becoming the most important and powerful country on earth, and the United States exercises informal dominance over those countries. But the outcome is the same, right? There's still economic underdevelopment. There's still constant violence. There's still intervention when they get out of line. So for a lot of characters in my book, whether it be Sukarno himself or a lot of the victims or even academics who study this, whether or not it was the plan, the Cold War was the means through which colonialism became neocolonialism. Um, and if you look at sort of the, the countries in the third world, the countries that came out of uh, uh, World War II and got their independence right afterwards, I make a list at the end of the book of the, the 25 largest countries by population. None of those countries went from third world to developed, right? Every single large country remains far, far behind. And this is like, this was one of the more emotionally difficult things about doing the book is that when I met these people that were, they grew up in Indonesia or Chile or Brazil in the 50s and 60s, they believed that, oh, well, okay, colonialism's over. We're going to take our place alongside the rich white countries. That's, the, that's obviously what's going to happen, right? I mean, if there's no more colonization of Africa and Asia, then we're going to catch up. And the way that they described their vision of what the, the future was going to be was both deeply inspiring but also quite tragic because you could see their eyes light up and talk about this world that they thought that they were going to participate in, and it didn't happen. And I'm not saying that the only reason it didn't happen was because there was U.S.-backed murder, U.S.-backed mass murder, but I think it's part of the story. Like, to go, like, to, to take over the title of your book, The Jakarta Method, how, like, this went from being, like, an, like an act of genocide in Indonesia to becoming, like, a, a tactic because it was so successful. It sort of crossed uh, the planet 
to like you meant you bring up Brazil, Chile, Central and South America. Uh, you were a journalist like living and working in Brazil and like that kind of brought you to this story because you talk about your interaction with the now president of Brazil, Bolsonaro, um, at a time yeah. when the uh, Dilma was being uh, essentially impeached for corruption charges that, let's just say in hindsight, look rather paltry. Yeah, there, it, was, it, was, it was a technicality. It was a political impeachment. Yeah, so I'm in Sao Paulo now. So, I mean, my daily life is, effect, is affected by Bolsonaro's sort of violently anti-communist um, approach to everything. But um, yeah, I was, a, I was a correspondent here for the Los Angeles Times from 2010 and 2016, and I first met Bolsonaro on the day of impeachment. And I said... I asked him, well, you know, do you have, don't you, aren't you worried about the fact that the international community is going to see this as kind of a stitch up? Like, do, do you think, don't you, aren't you worried that this is going to appear as an illegitimate impeachment? And he said, oh, no, no, I, we have to do this or else Brazil is going to become North Korea. And that was such a, like a ridiculous thing, even for him to say at the time that I didn't even use it. But lo and behold, two years later, he's the president. And um, I mean, his and his entire uh, political ideology is explicitly a celebration of the Jakarta method, right? So you can watch on YouTube, there's a clip of him saying, the only way Brazil is ever going to advance, we're ever going to improve this country, is if we do what the dictatorship didn't finish doing and we kill 20, 30 million people. Sorry, 20, 30,000 people, I'm translating from Portuguese. Um, so in a very, like, when I started working on this book, I told, like, the publishers and things, I was like, well, my contention is that the ghosts of violent anti-communism are haunting the politics of many many countries. But I ended up being proven far more right than I would have liked, right? I mean, he, like, the, the ghosts are, like, really back in Brazil. To the point, his, like, his foreign minister a couple weeks ago, he did, like, a, a late-night blog post where he reviewed the new Zizek book to, like, confirm his theory that coronavirus is an international communist plot. Uh, he, like, did a 3 a.m., you know, super, like, super screed where he claims, like, it's called Comuna Comuna virus, like communist virus instead of coronavirus. And this is like, this is back. And it never went away. And like, it was clear even in my time as corresponding here, and I think it's clear to most people that live in the so-called developing world, even though that's development is it's a question of whether or not it's happening. Most people understand that the violent interventions of the Cold War were formative, right? And this is sort of an academic literature. This is sort of fairly recognized now. And regular people know this in Chile and regular people know this in Vietnam or whatever. But in the United States, we don't view this. We view this in the United States. We view the Cold War as a heroic battle that happened in Berlin and maybe Moscow, and then the bad guys lost, and then it was over, and then just like everything else just gets shoved, shoved deep into the memory hole. But here in Brazil, it's like, it's, it's, I mean, on the way here, I saw, like on the way to this like little bunker I have that actually has good internet, there was a protest where they were claiming that the right-wing governor of Sao Paulo is communist because now he's in a fight with Bolsonaro. So like communism is just, is, is, is a perfect way to attack anything that you need to attack to solidify your power in, in, in South America. And, and, and you talk about how, like, after 1965, like, the, 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 the word Jakarta becomes sort of a buzzword. And you talk about how in sort of, like, various, like, dueling and, like, I guess street art, like, like yeah. in Brazil and otherwise, like, like right-wing groups who just write, like, Jakarta is coming, essentially, right. as, a, as, as a warning, a preview of what they, like, they were planning to do to the left in their country. Which is you yeah, know, mass murder, torture, disappearances, things like things, yeah, that. Yeah, and they did it. So when Allende took over in 1970 in Chile, we now have declassified files indicating that what Nixon was worried about was the possibility of democratic socialism succeeding in Chile. So the CIA, the White House, they needed to stop Allende, not because he was going to screw up the economy, not because he was bad for U.S. business, but if it worked, it would be a guiding light for other opponents of U.S. hegemony in South America. And that was a real problem. So they started U.S.-backed right-wing terrorism before Allende even takes power. And the Brazilian military, who is uh, running a dictatorship here that took over a U.S.-backed coup in 1964, they're in constant contact with the Chilean military. And during Allende's um, term in office, you start seeing this this graffiti on the walls, Jakarta is coming, or they would send postcards to the Houses of Socialists, um, one of whom I got to know pretty well, Carmen Hertz. And like it happened, it was right, Jakarta came. So 1973, the CIA does a, you know, assist in the coup, Pinochet takes over and they kill thousands of people. And of course, just like in Jakarta, they get away with it. Um, and then 
over the next few years, Chile and Brazil get together and they form Operation Condor, which is this transnational terror network across South America that is created so that they can kill anybody that escapes across the border. You know, they're killing tens of thousands of people in Argentina, but what happens if he gets away to Uruguay? Well, we'll we have a we have a Operation Condor, which will take take care of that. And this was a fundamental way of the uh, that. Latin America entered the 20th century. Like this was, this dominated Latin American politics for the second half of, of the 20th century. And it's only that democracy came back very recently. Like it's, it's very, very fresh stuff. And, and yeah, in Brazil it was called Operação Jacarta, which was, again, it was just, it was a mass murder program, Operation Jakarta. Uh, here it kind of backfired because they ended up killing a very famous journalist, Vladimir Herzog. Um, and that was, it caused a big back, backlash, including in the Catholic Church and that movement in the left side of the Catholic Church ended up sort of eventually leading to Lula in the early 21st century. But like, it's right, right just below the surface. And it's only because, it, like you said, it contradicts so violently the English language narrative about the Cold War that I think we don't talk about it so much. Uh, Matt, uh, I, know, I know you, you told me, because uh, like, you know, you, you, you've read much more of the book than I have. Uh, you, were, you were telling me about like, these sort of uh, tunic wearing uh, street gangs. I, I know you wanted to bring that up. Yeah, because there's... Uh, uh, you usually have uh, in these situations where you have really heightened ideological conflict within a country and there's a lot of polarization, you get people who want to, uh, who are sort of outliers. They're, they're early adopters, like they're, they're pre coup sort of incipient uh, beings. And one of them, I just wanted a little more information. It, w- uh, it was a group, I think you said in Brazil and also in Chile, that uh, went around beating up communists while wearing medieval tunics. Yeah, yeah, TFL, so Tradition, Family, and Liberty. Uh, they're back, by the way, like if you hang on in like weird... Do they still like, wear the tunics? I don't, I, I imagine, they, I'm sure they have like, yeah, I imagine they still do like sort of, it's trads, they're like 1960s trad Catholics, right? So they, they were, it was an anti-communist group and they would stand on the street and like sort of heckle. I mean, they also did karate, right? So like to, in order to be in the group, you had to do martial arts, cut your hair short, like sort of idealize a, a medieval past that never exists. I mean, this is Brazil, right? Like what, you know, what, tu- what t- tunics. But this was really, and they're, they're back. Like they're like, and so are the integralists. So the integralists were the 1930s fascists in Brazil. And they, they would like have a sigma on there, like the Greek S on their arm that, you know, to obviously to copy European fascism. And with Bolsonaro, they're back too. So like TFL is a like still existing anti-communist Catholic group. Uh, I think they, exi- they, they like expanded to the United States at one point as well. Yeah. Tradition, family and Liberty. It won't be too long before they drop the Catholicism like the rest of the Brazilian, right? Probably. Yeah. Well, um, no, well they, they're yeah. Like now the Catholics tend to be like, it's really the ev- evangelical church, which like that powers Bolsonaro more than yeah. the, the old Catholic fascists. Yeah. Yeah. That's so square. Like get out of here. Um, but when you talk about like like yeah like the 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 the, the tunic wearing trads and just like overall the kind of I don't know like the, the the psychology of 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 this terror but also the propaganda of it one thing I was struck by and you know you brought this up a little bit when you were talking about the the CIA Bing Crosby produced porn movie where they're like all of these like intensely like wasp guys from Connecticut and Maine sort of projected their own values or sense of like uh, morality onto the world and thought that it, everything would sort of neatly align with that. But like to go back to Indonesia, like I was fascinated by how like one of the sort of catalysts for like much of this mass murder were these like intensely baroque fantasies that were invoked by the coup plotters about what PKI were doing, and also like these sort of communist witches were uh, kidnapping military officers and cutting their dicks off, and it was just yep. like it was all made up. It was all complete fantasia. But what was fascinating about that is it became a big part of the propaganda effort. In that this was, of course, picked up by the New York Times, like these these horrible blood curdling curdling stories about what the the PKI is doing to these innocent people. But like, also, it's it's even more frightening because it's just this massive act of projection where they're telling you what they're going to do to you by accusing you of it. And then when an outlet like the New York Times picks it up, when you do those things to the people that you're targeting, it's like it's justified because they did all of these horrible like acts of witchcraft and sexualized violence that is really this like weird form of like wish fulfillment on b- behalf of the people who are doing it. Yeah, it was a um, so that story, we still don't understand it. It's like 
I guess the best way that I could summarize like academic consensus about that story is like, it's too good. So like there was this, there, like it's, it's hard to believe that Suharto came up with this like perfectly crafted sort of misogynistic version of anti-communist propaganda overnight by himself. Right. So a lot of people think that he, he had some help there, but he turned around and this, this, uh, this story of quite literally like an orgiastic torture castration. So that's the story, right? Is that like the, so f- like, first of all, let me say that Gurwani, the Indonesian women's movement, which was associated with the communist party was maybe the largest and most important feminist movement in the world at the time. Right. So this was like Gurwani stood for things that probably every liberal now believes in. Like they were the ones championing like equal, equal, equal treatment for women and polygamy and uh, gentle mutilation. And this was obviously they were they wanted to, to the, they wanted to end polygamy and general mutilation. Just to be clear yeah, about exactly that. yeah yeah uh, did I say the opposite yeah exactly <laughs> so so they were a, a really easy scapegoat right so they put it all on the women and they claimed that it was a sexual deviancy like a, a literally satanic ritual that literally removed the male organ from troops like they, they the, the guys that were killed were like the top troops of all time and they had their dicks cut off by crazed communist women. This is still the truth in Indonesia. Like they, they made a three hour film of this that Suharto played every, every year on the anniversary of the beginning of the violence on public TV. And even though Jokowi took over, who's this kind of like Obama figure in Indonesian politics, the, the military still plays it. So like that version is more officially true than what we all know actually happened because they have, they have the power there. And like, as you said, like, Everybody always, before you do a coup, you always convince yourself that the other team is going to do a coup to you. Like, yep. it, every time. Like, you go up and down. In Brazil, even though they had no evidence for this, they convinced themselves, oh, if we don't do a coup, there's going to be a coup. Just like, I'm sure if I ever, you know, if I get an interviewed by, like, Fox or whatever about this book, they're going to say, well, if we didn't kill a million people, I'm sure they would have killed 1.5 million. You know, like, yeah. Right. Yeah, <laughs> you, know, yeah. you, you always convince yourself that if you don't do this thing, the exact same thing is going to happen, but but worse. And it's um, a very. I was just want to say that it's yeah. it, um, that that goes like from every level of person, from you know grunts carrying out things like this to the highest levels of policy, uh, because a lot of those top level CIA guys and uh, Defense Department people who made these policies, they really did believe that they were justified because the Soviets were doing the exact same thing and worse. Yeah, and they're part of the great game. And the thing is, is that we knew kind of at the time, and now in the historical retrospective, it's unarguable. They absolutely were not. No, they the were Soviets not. were doing anything. Honestly, Even, you could criticize them for not doing more to help some of these goddamn fledgling anti-colonial movements. They were not helpful. They were no. not there. They were not at any of these places seating, uh, seating you know, uh, the military with, with, uh, with secret agents and shit. And they were not planning coups. They did not do it. The, and when there was, when somebody would like, what an anti, uh, what a communist would take power, most more time than not, they were like, oh shit, now what do we do? No, that I mean, that's how the Cold War started. The Cold War started because the Greeks refused to stand down after World War II. Yeah. The Greek leftists, even though Stalin was like, no, just give up and lose, and yeah. let them, you know, let them kill you. And Truman, you know, stood up and said, we have to, we have to take this on because the Greek communists. But Stalin, I mean, obviously Stalin is not someone that cares about human rights. But he was afraid of the United States, right? Like he was like, you you don't want to you don't want to provoke them; they're crazy. And that you see this like up and down in the Cold War. So like when Allende was elected in 1970, Fidel calls him and he's like, don't provoke the like, don't do anything to provoke Washington. They're like they're they're out of control. They will overreact. So Fidel stayed away from Allende's um, inauguration for precisely that reason. And in countries like Chile and Brazil, when there was like a tiny left that was being used by the United States as an excuse to um, crush whatever government they wanted to, the official Moscow line was, oh, no, Latin America is a semi, semi-colonial part of the world. You have to develop capitalism. Don't do revol- Just like do nothing, right? Like just help the bourgeoisie create a capitalist power. Because, you know, there was that element of Marxism-Leninism. You could find a reason to say that. But also they were just like, we don't want to 
provoke Washington. If we if we yeah, do we just anything, got, we just got blown up. <laughs> yeah, we want to rebuild a little bit. We don't want to do any of that. I mean, so there was this the, the widespread belief that Stalin's going to invade Western Europe. He didn't want to do that at all. He thought Stalin thought that there would be another intra imperialist war that you know the that Europe and the United States would would go after each other because they, he believed that communism would just happen. But no, you're totally right. Like they were. To, <laughs> In, in order to justify the things they were doing, they had to believe that something else was going to happen, even though there was no evidence for that. Um, like in talking about like the way like the, the massive things like this that have been effectively memory hold, like because they worked so well. That's the reason most people don't know about them. It's save for the you know, in, in, not even the people like in the country who be, who believe the official party line. You know, the like the, the the victors narrative of why they did this or why they had to do it or why the people they were killing were criminals or subversive or you know revolutionaries or something like that. But like, what does it mean to our understanding of, of genocide? Do you think about th- this entire era of history where genocide was directed not at an ethnic group or religious minority? But at a politi- like a, 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 a political part of existing within like the democratic body politic, and that like the world that we live in now has been so deformed by the actual like extermination of like a vast swath of political belief and practice. Yeah, I mean, it's a like that's an ongoing question. Like, there's a there's like a, a really like raging debate whether or not it should be called the genocide, or whether or not there should be like a different category of thing. Um, what I will say is that going through these stories, like, and I spent like three years with these people that like lived through it, survived it, or had their friends that didn't survive. It, it doesn't just raise a question about the nature of certain, this crime or that crime, but I think it, it raises questions about the nature of U.S. hegemony, like the nature of the world that has been created in the shadow of the United States, to what extent this is something we want to celebrate to what extent it's something that needs to be preserved by going to Cold War II with China. But it's woven right in there, right? I mean, if it, wa- if it wasn't re- woven right into the fabric of the order that we all inhabit, it would be obvious to us, right? It, it would stand out. The reason it doesn't stand out is because it's right, it's, it's right in there. Um, and like in, in thinking about like the, the ongoing silence as being basically one of the big parts of victory is the, the, the silence surrounding things like this. And I'm thinking about like the continued silence um, from like the heights of American power and like liberal intelligentsia, like not people who you would generally regard as like, you know, sort of ghoulish University of Chicago coup mongers. But like the prime example in my head is Samantha Power and her book, you know, A Problem from Hell about U.S. policy toward, and genocide in the 20th century that omits the story of Indonesia entirely. I mean, what do you make yeah. of that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's not. I think it's just very, very inconvenient, right? I mean, like it's it's remarkable because like Indonesia is like f- pretty far back, right? So okay, it's 1965, but the the end of this wave of anti-communist mass murder happens in Central America in the 80s, and like these are to a very large extent the people who send their children to the United States to work. Like these are a lot. Like I met a lot of people in like Guatemala and Guatemalan highlands that are like, yeah, yeah, they kill, came and they killed half my village and. Now there's no source of income, and that's why we have to go to the United States. And like, it's just never discussed that this is m- what be might be the reason that there is a wave of migrants from Central America. And like, we have this liberal this liberal narrative, like, oh well, no, they just like like believe in America so much. And if, <laughs> <laughs> and if or I they add, want, or they or George Soros uh, has got them on speed is, dial, is paying them. Yeah, and uh, when I ask them, I'm like, well, do you believe in America? They're like, no, no they kill, you killed my whole village. Like, we just have to. We have to go there. And I think like um, it's if you're the hegemon, it's just not in your best interest to talk about those kinds of things. Right. Like it's just and then what was the name? Uh, it's killing me. I'm forgetting this name. But yeah, no, the, the guy that they brought back who was whose yeah. explicit job was to tell the press that they were they were wrong. Elliot about, Abrams. Yeah. Elliot Abrams. He came okay. back to justify coup attempt number whatever that was last year, two or three in Venezuela. Yeah. And, you know, like. It just doesn't matter what he did. Like, it every, like there's, no, there's no dispute that what his job was was to lie about war crimes being committed by our allies. And then he just comes back and he's allowed to do it again. And, like, I think that there's something to be said for, like, that old Chomsky thing that, like, if you let people talk about it, but only in, like, a small amount of space, it just doesn't, like, it doesn't matter. Like, you can, you don't have to censor it if, if it's just, like, not 
something people want to hear or want to speak about. And I think one of the big reasons they do have a, such a hard time talking about it, it's, it's not even necessarily the, the, uh, uh, the, the messy fact of our involvement in these things. I think that could be massaged, especially when you're talking about people like power. Uh, the whole point of talking about genocides is to mark, if you're, talk, if you're someone like power and you are assuming America is the sole hegemon of the world, American military is the world's police officer, like they really do think that, and therefore the cops represent, like in a country, their police represent legitimate force and authority. Right. And so that means the U.S. military represents legitimate force and authority. The United States political structure and uh, state capacity represent illegitimate authority. And so even when something happens, like a million people get massacred in Indonesia, that is essentially maybe excessive force, but it is violence carried out in the pursuit of peacekeeping, of the greater mission of maintaining a world order. Definitionally, right? By, yeah. by definition, if the U.S. government does it, it must somehow be uh, fueled by either good intentions or be in the service of some larger project, which, everyone, which is going to be good for everyone. It's like we are sort of like epistemologically unable to consider these things as what they are, right? It's like, well, the, you know, we did it, so it can't be, it can't be bad, right? Like, and, and so that's why people would rather not remember that it happened because yeah, it's, harder to, it's harder to assimilate. Yeah, and like, I don't know, for example, if I would have been allowed to do this book like if Obama was still the president, for example. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, well, there would be less, I think, yeah, there'd be less demand. People would be like, why, why are you bringing up old shit? Like, what are you talking, like, because he was, you know, that's why he became Muslim. Just, I mean, not just kidding, but like, that's why he moved to, <laughs> That's why he moved to Indonesia and had exposure to Islam is because his stepfather was called back from Hawaii, just like everybody else that was living in Indonesia and living abroad. They had to come back and sort of prove to Suharto that they were loyal to the new regime not, and not communists. And the communists, quote unquote, were stuck abroad. And so Obama moved back to uh, Jakarta in 1966 or uh, maybe 67 or something right after the, the genocide because of the genocide. And in Dreams from My Father, he writes very clear, like he understands what happened. Like... He not only understands what happened, he understands what it did to the country, how it deforms, uh, how it deformed Indonesia. Yeah, there's that, like, I wanted to find the quote that he did, that he has from his stepdad. Well, there's one, there's one moment where he and his mother realize that he's been changed, that he's been sort of corrupted morally by this new world, that he's unhappy, that he doesn't want to talk about things. And at one point he asks him, like, have you ever killed a snake or something like that? I don't know. It's, uh, um, I could look this up. But at one point, his father was like, well, look, basically there's two types of, you know, do you want to be the, the person that gets killed or the person that does the killing? Like, that's the only option. I'm paraphrasing, but it was a very, like, sort of brute realization of what power looks like. I mean, no, he, it's, in the, it's in Dreams of My Power. He says something like, back in America, power is hidden, but here power was bare. Power, power was something that was right in your face. And they eventually left Indonesia kind of partially for this reason. They didn't like it, right? They didn't like the obviousness of the brutality of what sustained that uh, system. And it was clear that he understood how it compromised the people under it, that, he, that his stepfather had to make these horrible choices of either, like, I kind of keep my mouth shut about this regime, or I could be called a communist too, and, you know, that's not going to help anybody. Yeah, and, like, obviously, you know, you know we know, I mean, I'm the age where when I remember when Obama ran as an anti-war president, right? And like, we know what happened when he actually gets into to office. And like, yeah. if you look, if you, if you take a big step back and you look at all the presidents that enter the White House, you know, the government of the United States, the same thing happens to all of them, right? They, stand, they end up operating the national security apparatus, the foreign policy war machine that is existing, right? They, they get there and they have to deal with that. And um, no matter what they said or what they were acting like beforehand, that's just kind of like what happens to presidents in the United States, it seems like. Uh, Matt, do you have any, do you have any uh, further uh, questions or queries from your, uh, from your outline or your notes? I got, I got a couple questions. Okay. One, uh, <laughs> you had one good, that's, that's one, explana one explanation for Obama or partial explanation is he went to Venezuela or he went to Indonesia and saw what had happened. And it essentially destroyed any hope that he would believe that anything could change for any reason. Uh, and, or also that his mom was a CIA agent. That's the other possible it's a, answer, yeah. right? Uh, uh, there, I guess there's rumors. I mean, he, in the book, he, kind of ex he, he says that his mom is working at the embassy and realizes that they are all, everyone at the embassy is one racist. 
and two, a spook pretending to be something else. So in that book, he seems to have a pretty sophisticated, he says like, you know, his mom's like, every, everyone there is like a quote unquote journalist or economist, but then they just go away for a long time and they never do anything like, so, um, I think he, like he ends, I think he ends up with a pretty sophisticated understanding of U.S. foreign policy as a young man. Due to being in the CIA. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, due, to being, due to being literally created by the CIA so that he being could be the first Muslim. In a, in uh, a laboratory. <laughs> in a laboratory, yeah. I, I don't think that that's too far of a stretch to claim. I mean, I do believe that in 25 years we're going to find out stuff about 2020 that is more insane than anything we could come up with right now. Uh, oh, that's, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're just, they're just dabbing on us all day. <laughs> yeah. 2020 is the year everyone decided all these s- secret spooks and ghouls decided to just say fuck it and start dabbing all over us. Yeah. Just to be like, look, what are you going to do about it? You know? Yeah. Like, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> and what, like, what, what are you going to do, do about, about it? it? Yeah. Matt, there was like, uh, there was like the CIA's official Twitter account. Like just this last week was like, Hey, looking to travel someone by plane in the world. Did you know that the CIA created its own airplane company called Air <laughs> yeah. America? Yeah, like, it's pretty cool. It Check us. it out. Yeah, pretty cool. Check it out. The CIA had its own air, fucking airline throughout the sixties and seventies, and, and it doesn't matter. Like even like it's, yeah. even if like they got to figure like five to ten percent of the people that see that might Wikipedia it, but even then, like only you know half of them will read the whole article or whatever, and like they still just get it. It just work. Like it doesn't matter. Like it, it can be all right out there. And hey guys, will, we've been putting that Manson a- acid in the water supply for the last thirty years. You haven't seen a real thing your entire life. <laughs> yeah, what are you gonna? What are you gonna you, do? I mean, like, you think that's air you're breathing? Yeah, like you don't. I mean, working on this book was really weird because it was like there was like my normal life where I hang out with people that are like you know like me in America or Brazil, even Brazil or whatever. But I spent like three years going deep into this stuff that made it like there was profound cognitive dissonance, right? Like it made it very hard to just like kind of walk around and interact with the world in a normal way, right? Like. It's very yeah. hard to maintain this stuff in your head, to understand the degree to which it is generative of the world we occupy, and to also occupy it, right? Like, yeah. And it took, it took me a long time to, like, emerge. Like, I had, like, quite, I mean, I feel very, like, stupid and pathetic complaining about, like, any psychological difficulties I had because, like, everyone that I was talking to, like, had the worst thing you could ever imagine happen to them. But, like, it took me a while to, like, get back to this world where I just pretend everything's normal again. Like... I like, oh, I finished the book. It's over there. Like, it's in that book if you want to read it. Uh, and now I'm just going to, like, come back to that world that I, like, understood to be real before. And it is real, but, like, it's hard to think about why it became that way. It's, uh, yeah. uh, and, I, yeah, I think that even, you know, they challenge you to, like, to do that. And I think most people just don't want to do it. It's hard, you know, it sucks. I have only one more question. And it yeah. just be, I have to ask it because uh, I know Felix would if he was here. Uh, are you related to Ninja? Yeah, I don't know. Is <laughs> really? That, no, I don't know. Why? Why do I look like him? Wait, no, no, I, no, 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 last... no. Matt, his name is Bevins. Ninja's name is oh, Blevins. Right. Is Blevins? Blevins. Edit it out. How is Tyler? Out. Edit that out. Yeah, no, but no. It's, that's well. I think that my surname. I think that's not even a real surname. I think that like it's Bevin in like Wales, and then they added like different letters when you got yeah. to America. Um. No, but uh, yeah, he's my brother, like in spirit, I guess. You know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Leave close it enough, in. Close enough. Close enough. Close no, enough. Yeah. For me. It, yeah. yeah like, it's it's good. It's good to, yeah. It's good to have a, a reference to Tyler Ninja Blevins after an hour of talking about state-backed genocide in the Cold War. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that, that's no. why people tune in to Chapo Trap House. But it's uh, true. It's the same thing. It is kind of the whole rich human pageant. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, but no, seriously, though, uh, Vincent Bevins, I want to thank you very much for uh, talking to us uh, today. And uh, the book is The Jakarta Method. Uh, please, please buy, like, and subscribe.